Hello, everybody. Thank you guys for coming today. Um, thank you, John, for hosting us. Uh, my pleasure. And, uh, you know, I don't think anybody needs the background on why we're here today. Everybody knows Jack. So uh, thank you, Jack, for coming in today. Thank you. Um, right? He's going to keep us entertained for at least the next couple hours. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, I threw these uh, in closed forms yesterday, and I think I'd like to make, uh, let's see, I don't have to put this on when I'm performing. Um, I'm going to make a couple more, and we're going to try to dry them out and get them to the right consistency for uh, paddling. Those, those little forms with a with the rattles inside are uh, thrown like this. And um, I like to chase the air around inside them. I poke a hole in them. It's always fun because you poke a hole in an enclosed form and it just goes whoop. You can feel the air come out. And that way you have a cushion. And you start chasing that air around inside. Figure out what to do down here. The bottom's always a little thicker, so you can just push it. I'm scuffing when I hit it, so I'm pushing the clay ahead of it. It's a nice contemplative thing to do the day after you throw things. You try to figure out what kind of form is going to take shape. It's really just an idea of how you're going to change the form and then figure out when it's done. Maybe I can give this a ridge up on the top. Almost like a little landscape that's developing here. And I like to use the brayer for uh, just changing the form a little bit. And maybe if you were here yesterday, you might have thought about something that went on yesterday or something you heard or, or observed. And if you'd like to ask any questions, even if you weren't here yesterday, I like questions. I manufacture so many questions in my life every day. <laughs> so it's just that uh, we're curious people in, in the, every sense of the word. We're curious for what we do. Working in clay is not something anybody grows up hearing we need more of. We need more handmade pots in the world. We need more people who like what they do. That, I think, is so important. Well, uh, you can come up and, and handle these. They are um, what I would call um, just right. <laughs> they're, they hold their form, uh, but they're not sticky. And um, after you've done this for a while, you, you know what you can get away with. And every clay is going to be different. Some clays just don't like this and they, uh, they will crack. And so you use other clays. And um, this one, I think, is uh, 
standard clay body that they use here. It has a fair amount of uh, fire clay in it and probably gold art and ball clay and uh, some flint and feldspar. So I'm just going to close up this belly button part down here. That's fun. It's fun and you you don't have to know what you're going to do with these things. You, you, that's that's something you'll figure out as you go along. I did put some rattles in here. For rattles, I use uh, little pieces of porcelain that are uh, used in ball mills for uh, grinding materials down. And I wrap them in some uh, plastic tape and then the, the tape just burns away in the bisque and the little pieces stay in there and they move around. So it's a surprise when you pick the piece up it has something inside making a little noise. And I asked my Japanese friends to tell me the name for stone with a secret voice. And the name for that is Ishi no Sasayaki. Ishi no Sasayaki. Stone with secret voice. And they all have a very different sound because the clay, not all clays have the same kind of uh, uh, vitreous uh, quality. Some are harder than others and they have a higher pitch to them. And the bottom. Give it a little place to rest. I got this idea from a little piece that David Shainer sent me years and years ago. David died in, in uh, 2005. He was, he was my uh, hero potter, I guess you'd say. I really loved the work that he made and his attitude towards making. Very unpretentious person but also uh, uh, imaginative, hardworking guy. One of the first people to make his living as a potter out in Montana. Started the Archie Bray Foundation, a uh, very famous place where uh, people go to work, sometimes after grad school, sometimes instead of grad school. And he sent me a little thing about the size of a hockey puck. I think it was made by putting two little slabs together uh, over a stone, and then taking the stone out and pinching it. And it has this little sound in it, a nice feature. Yeah, David is. Some, someone, people growing up working in clay today have to be told about. And it's worth looking him up on the internet and uh, seeing some of his work. He made some marvelous sculptural pieces in the last five years of his life. David died from ALS, um, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, a, a uh, a progressive disease that um, nobody has figured out how to cure. 
also called Lou Gehrig's disease. Okay, well, there's one. Could have texture. I like putting things in the wood kill that don't have much texture because the flame delivers color and pattern to the form. And I am not a person who draws. I can draw with words, I can make poems, but um, I don't make patterns on things very much. So um, let's see how a bigger one might go. So what I'm trying to say is, I like the way that the flame over the course of a long firing tells the pot what is happening to it. So the pot ends up telling us what happened to it. It is a way of documenting what went on in the fire. It tells a story. That's how I got interested in that kind of firing because I, I found an old jug in a flea market about 1977 and I was intrigued by it and I wanted to learn how to make things like that. So it, it's a conjunction between the creator of the piece and the firing and it's very unpredictable. Even if you've been at it for 40 years or so, you're always learning new things, which means you're willing to discover um, all kinds of things that happen. Not all of them delightful. Um, so sometimes the results are horrible, but you learn from them. So you try not to do stupid things consistently. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm So there's a form now, and we're going to give it another identity, another form. So I'm scuffing that clay. I wasn't doing this when I was teaching, but I think what I would do now if I were teaching a class, I'd have everybody make a series of enclosed forms, and then uh, we would paddle each other's forms. It's a really good way to um, overcome any kind of preciousness about what you've made because you didn't make it, and so you're you're exploring in a different way. When I taught teapots, I had everybody make bodies, spouts, lids, and um, you know the main component, and just put them out on the table. And then everybody goes and you just choose things and you put them together and make teapots. Also, I started the teapot exercise by giving everybody a ball of clay about the size of a tennis ball, and in one minute, they had to make something that was recognizable as a teapot. Not a functional teapot, but something that when somebody looked at it, they said teapot, because what they had made said teapot. It could be flat, it could be anything. Just whatever you can do that you had never thought of doing before and you had a minute to do it. And it was good.
spur of the moment. Kind of animal-like, kind of fish-like. Pretty much organic. Maybe it looks as though it grew. Maybe it looks as though it used to be a round stone that got tumbled around in a stream for a thousand years. And there's a pleasant sensation when you're doing this because you can feel that air moving in there. It's pneumatic. Maybe you want to give it some different planes. And if you're going to fire this in a wood kill, you're making a form that is very confusing to a flame. A flame is going to get around this. Suppose I'm the chimney and you're the firebox. Um, how I aim this into the fire is going to have everything to do with how it looks. Because if it's at an angle like this, the flame is going to come in and hit it, and it's going to get caromed. It's going to um, go off here at an angle. And so the part behind it is going to be protected, and it's going to appear very different from this side. And then the light flowing ash is going to come over the piece, and it's going to land back here and it's going to melt down softly. And the ash that lands up here is going to get uh, plastered against this clay. Bless your heart. <laughs> um, and uh, that ash is likely to uh, gather and run down in little rivulets. And I don't know what goes on over here. We'll have to see. <laughs> so um, this has everything to do with how it gets positioned in the kill. And so we have, we, we trust what we know and we realize that what we know is always limited by the exigencies of any particular firing. So that's why making things that are different, shaped differently, opens you to the possibilities of discovering not only what this particular clay will do, what this form will do, but also <coughs> where it goes and the zone of the kill. Kills have zones and the zones are apparent from experience that we bring from observing <coughs> pieces from other firings. So <coughs> we all start too late, um, but we do the best we can with what we observe, and we find things. Nobody is ever going to make a living making these things, but that's, that's only one criteria for um, making things, only one reason. It's important, I don't know, it's either important not to have to make a living from doing what we do, or it's just as important to be able to make a living from what we do, or any combination of those things. I, th I think about that all the time. <coughs> but. My house is paid for, my studio, my land is paid for. I don't know, I've maybe paid some kind of dues to just be able to 
make things I never would have made before. If somebody had showed me these kinds of things 20 years ago and said, this is what you're going to be making in 20 years, I would have said, I want the operation. I want my brain changed. I don't want to make stuff like this. It's stupid. But I wasn't ready for it. <coughs> I would have hated all the things in this little show here um, 30 years ago because I wasn't ready for them. I wasn't ready to make them. I wasn't ready to see them or appreciate them. It's that way with certain kinds of music, certain kinds of food. If you'd have given me kimchi in high school, uh, the things I would have said about kimchi. No, I love kimchi. <laughs> Same way with Bartok string quartets. Hated Bartok string quartets the first time I ever heard any. So our, our tastes are always changing, probably in unpredictable ways. Music, food, things we make, things we look at. Can you think of a single pot or object that you have seen that influenced anything that you made after you saw it? I don't mean copying it. I mean to notice something about it, how it was put together the kind of statement that it made, um, the kind of feeling that seemed to come off it. I remember hearing a guy describe a bowl that he had lived with for 25 years. And he said it just seemed like shaped energy when he saw it. And it still had that feeling. You remember yourself remembering it, and you also experience yourself seeing it with your current way of seeing things. Pottery teaches us about observing and noticing stuff. Also, it slows us down. This kind of work does. I always taught people to hand build before I um, show them about the wheel. I started on the wheel, but I think hand building enables people to make things that are more distinctively their own. It takes a while working on the wheel to get to the point where you can use the wheel as a tool for expressiveness because everything is is coming out round and um, but that's a starting point And when you're working on one piece, don't, no matter if you're coil building it or what you're doing, it gives you time to, to think and observe. And the wheel, it has its own motion. And I think these things are, they lend themselves to, uh, to thoughtfulness. Okay, just pushing that air around in there. I'll come back to this after a bit. It's just a little bit sticky. Not quite as dry as the other one.
almost like a little landscape. <laughs> and um, I made a few cups yesterday. I'll trim them. One of our favorite illusions is that the world doesn't have enough cups. <laughs> so it, it doesn't matter if it's true or not. As long as we like to make cups, we're so privileged in what we're doing. We can do that. And when when people are made happy by the cups that we happily make, it's a good circle. Yes, I have done that when I worked at another potter's studio one time. And I liked it, and I think it made good sense. <clears throat> I just haven't transitioned over to that yet. But um, yesterday, I have such trouble. There are only a couple. OK. When I was in Germany researching my salt glaze book, I never saw a potter sitting down to throw. They all stood standing up. And um, <clears throat> the early potters in this country used treadle wheels, and they stood up. I think that's because they were, um, I think the British potters also threw standing up. I think it's probably just Americans that sit down and throw. I don't know why. I like to throw from a or a trim on a chuck, and uh, when it's just put a little piece of plastic over it. These are still pretty wet.
not enough plastic. So I was trying to make a cup that had some movement in it, so it wasn't really straight up and down. It had a, a place where, instead of it being symmetrical, there were little changes in the plane going around it. And everybody's hand is going to fit the cup differently. So you're going to find out where it feels comfortable to drink from. And also, if you're using glaze on it, the glaze is going to move a little bit, or it's going to melt in a different way when it comes to a small ridge. In other words, it's just going to accentuate what's already here, and it's going to It's going to make it better. Whenever, whenever I asked a German potter why they did something, there was a universal, at least a nationalistic answer. And because it makes it better, I thought, OK. So that's why when somebody asks you why you do something, you can just say, it makes it better. And everybody will understand. I'm going to get a little more plastic to go on there. I can't work right when from a flat stool. I want it tipped in toward the action. My favorite wheel is a Randall kick wheel. I think you have to be over 60 to even know what a Randall kick wheel is. That, that's OK. It's, uh, and you have to own property because it weighs at least 200 pounds, and you can't be carrying it up to a third floor apartment. Um, it's there. It's a presence. I wrote a poem about the Randall wheel. It has a motor that you use for centering and uh, fast speed work. But you can tell the electric, electric company to just take a break after you've centered the clay. The momentum of the wheel, which weighs 115 pounds, is just going to keep going. It's quiet. It's really quiet. And it slows down as the pot is getting thinner. There's a beautiful uh, organic principle involved. When the pot is getting thinner and more delicate, you're working in silence. And this mysterious wheel down here is just rolling along. Some of the earliest potter's wheels were powered by a person who sat opposite the potter and turned a, a rope like this which made the wheel go around. And I think that is the person who invented the flywheel. This gives you a little something 
extra to see when you turn the pot over a different kind of foot going from a, a geometric foot to a circular cup. I would fool around with this a little more <coughs> after it it does set up a little bit. Okay, gives it a little platform, little lift. Also, lets you know how much clay you have down here. We gain remarkable sensitivity uh, from working with clay. We look at something and we know how much it ought to weigh. And when we pick it up, it's either confirmed or not. It's either heavier or lighter or just right. And that comes from the sort of attentiveness of consistent making over years and years. One time I visited uh, an old timey potter in, <clears throat> in North Carolina named Zedith Teague. And I went there with some students to her shop and um, she said, you the teacher? I said, yep. She said, can you turn a pitcher? I said, yep, yeah, I'll try. She said, can you turn one that feels empty? I thought, there's somebody that knows what she's talking about. Does it feel empty? When you pick it up, you know, you make your first pitchers feel as though they've got about a half an inch of mercury in the bottom of them. They're, they're way too heavy. You're picking up the pitcher. A really good pitcher is light enough so that you feel the weight of what's in it, but not the, uh, the actual pitcher weight disappears. So this little hip down here is where our finger goes to pick up and hold it. It gives us a sense of where we are in the world. Handling cups is one of the most intimate experiences that we have with ceramics. And so we, we like thinking that somewhere there's going to be somebody that this cup is going to resonate with. And if it's a wood-fired cup, it may not give itself up completely the first time you see it. It may take using it over a long period of time because there's so much to see in wood-fired cups. I'm talking about cups that, that have been fired for a long time. They take a long time to see because of the subtlety and the nuances of color and texture. So four-sided cup, maybe a squarish foot. I still make cups with handles. There was one. I brought one just to show you that I know how to make <laughs> mugs. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it is just to illustrate a principle. It's not the world's best mug and not the world's worst. It's just a, <coughs> it's a functional mug 
I like the way it shows how glazes are just exquisitely dependent on their thickness. That glaze is very simple. It's from John Britt's book on uh, uh, high fire glazes called Shell Chino. And it only has, I think it only has three ingredients. I think it's nepheline, cyanite, and spodumene, and zircopax. I did put 10% clay in it uh, to make it a little more opaque. But we've been getting wonderful results with that in our kills, both the, uh, the gas kill. That was fired in a gas kill. Um, both the gas kill and the wood kill. There's a large kind of tea bowl <coughs> over there with uh, dark clay, and that has the shell chino glaze on it. As I told people yesterday, I haven't studied tea bowls. Tea bowls are a very precise uh, objects to learn about. There's, there's study involved in making tea bowls. I went to a Ken Matsuzaki workshop one time and um, he, he's a tea master. He studied them, he knows what to look for. And he said that potters who haven't studied tea and tea ware uh, shouldn't make tea bowls. A tea bowl is called a cha wan. Cha means tea, wan means bowl, tea bowl. So because I haven't studied tea, I don't call what I make tea bowls, but my last name starts with T, so I have a little stamp with a T in a circle, so I can still call them tea bowls, but they're not real tea bowls, you know what I mean? So I'm halfway there. Okay, I'm just going to trim another cup here. And then <clears throat> we're going to do a little exercise with our telephones. I wish that there was narration that went along with this site because it's the most brilliant approach to <clears throat> the creative process that I know of that happens so quickly. It must only be a minute or a minute and a half. Anybody know Ira Glass from uh, This American Life? He wrote, he wrote this little thing about the creative process and it just comes at you so quickly online that you'll want to watch it a couple times. I've heard him say it, but when I called it up this morning, uh, it, it wasn't, uh, there was no audio portion to it. <clears throat> so uh, maybe it just depends what device you use to look at it. but. It is so succinct, so to the point.
How high should the foot be? <coughs> um, what kind of foot do you want? Is it going to taper? Is it going to be round? I'd like to have a little undercut here in case I use a temaku glaze or something that's likely to flow a little bit. I want there to be a little catch basin here, but not overstated. Just enough so that you'll see on some of my tea bowls over there that, that the glaze has run down and it has caught in this little ditch that keeps it from running off onto the foot. Now when the clay is a little bit soft like this, <clears throat> you can compress it. And just take care of the hardness of the edge because everything else in the bowl is uh, kind of soft. It's a dilemma, really, when you get to the foot. The foot is kind of like a frame on this cup. It, it lifts it up. It doesn't get in the way. It elevates this, what's going on up here. And this, this cup has a, a real pronounced hip to it. So we'd have to see how it works. I know how I would position this in the kill. <clears throat> I'd, I'd like a little bit of ash to fall here. All these little things happen when we work for a long time. OK, this last one I do, then we'll, we'll get out our phones. Little faceted cup. Have you, have you arrived at a form in your work that you can call your cup? Do you think that there are certain cups that you make that have an identity that speaks for you? That somebody could say, yeah, this looks like it was made by Suzanne. And you turn it over and it says Suzanne. You go, dynamite. And you recognize it, you know? We recognize forms that people make. And that pleases us. And maybe forms of cups are something that you will never arrive at as being able to call it yours or think of it as yours. Maybe it's, it's all part of a, a learning process. And maybe you're going backwards you don't think of it as backwards. You think of it as, yeah, I have some more to say about this form. I'm going to make some more of them. Oh, good. This is rippling up a little bit. So it helps keep this foot from being so totally different in feeling from the rest of it. Can you remember the first handmade cup that you ever bought or drank from? That's not half bad. You know what I like? I like 
this little thing that happens in here, there's a sharp edge before it gets to the undercut. And sometimes there's almost a wee shelf there where glaze is going to catch. And it's going to puddle up just a tiny bit. There's a couple tea bowls over here that have that happening down here. You feel lucky that the glaze started to pool up there and create a, a semi-opaque glassy surface and you look into it. So glazes that have visual depth are interesting to us. Some of the bottles that were fired on their sides over there have a very pellucid pale green glaze that you look into and through. And that is the kind of thing happening on porcelain that just threw everybody in Europe off base with paroxysms of delight when the Chinese brought porcelain to them. The Chinese introduction of porcelain to Europe, it changed Europe. And I mentioned this book yesterday called The Arcanum by Janet Gleason. I recommend that everybody read that book. It, it's the most, has anybody read this book? Oh, for shame. All of you should be shamed. It's, <laughs> it, if you're, if you're going to work in clay, you really need to read this book. And um, <clears throat> The Arcanum, A-R-C-A-N-U-M. The Arcanum was the name of the mythical substance that uh, people were, uh, alchemists, were searching for that would turn base metals into gold. And one man in um, Germany, Saxony, I think, uh, claimed to be able to do this. And so he was captured by uh, the, the emperor, the king, and he was imprisoned in a dungeon laboratory for 18 years under the edict that he had to discover how to make porcelain in Europe, and it had to be like the Chinese porcelain. And he escaped a couple of times, and he was brought back and put back in his dungeon. <laughs> And uh, eventually, he came up with it. He discovered uh, where to find kaolin in, in um, uh, Germany and how to make glazes. And there's so much drama in this book uh, that it, it's just, you got to read it. It just gives you such an understanding and such an appreciation of how privileged we are that there is no moratorium on information. That being a potter at this time in history is unbelievably privileged. We can find out anything. There aren't any secrets. When I first started making pots in 1962, I, I knew a potter who lived in Concordville. And he was really pleasant. He was happy that there was somebody else who was interested in making pots, and I bought clay from him, and we had a wonderful relationship. And I thought, isn't it great that potters are so willing to share their information? So we drove up to Allentown one time to visit a potter one Sunday afternoon, and he was a, a good production potter, made a variety of nice pieces, nice glazes, everything was to like about his, his work. And I, I, I said to him, I really, I really like your work. And uh, he said, do you make pots? And I said, well, I'm learning. And then I said, where do you get your clay? And he said, I get my clay out of the ground. And he went back to work. As soon as I told him I was learning, it just seemed to make him bristle with some kind of competitive edge, like I was going to eat into his market with my two-pound cups. <laughs> it was just ridiculous. So I learned that not everybody is, uh, 
as accommodating as Tom was, the first guy, but mostly people were, were very good. And after my first teacher died, six months after showing me how to use the wheel, um, he passed away, he got leukemia, and, and his, his four kids were here last night. They were so, so great to see them again. The Keatsman family. So after Jim died, I went into the, uh, what was then the Philadelphia College of Art, now the University of the Arts. And I took a Monday evening class with uh, Louis Mendez. And Louis asked me the central question of my career. I had been making little bottles. And uh, they had nice shapes and everything, but they were just barely hollow. I didn't realize what it was like to pick up a light pot. And one time Louis came by my wheel and he said, Jack, do you want to keep making what you're making or do you want to learn to make really good pots? And I thought, ah, oh, so there's quality involved. <laughs> and uh, so he asked me to make six little cylinders, which I was not able to do. And um, another time, Louis, uh, responded to a comment I made. I said, I'm, I've always had a thing about my intelligence because I've never been able to break into three figures on an IQ test. And Louis, I said to Louis, you know, I may make up in, in persistence what I lack in intelligence. And Louis said, oh, Jack, persistence is intelligence. <laughs> I think he was being kind to me, but maybe it is. And everybody has to be persistent with clay. We have to remember, and we are asking our bodies to remember. Our bodies are teachable entities, and we're putting information into them, and we're hoping that the best of it uh, lasts, and it does. Don't you think it's a miracle to wake up every morning and know how to center? That somehow knowing how to center didn't go away while we were asleep? I mean, maybe it's possible to have a stroke where part of our brain is so specifically affected that if we tried to make pots, it wouldn't work. I mean, wouldn't that be devastating? Say yes. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm continually grateful that uh, whatever it is that houses this information, uh, how to throw, how to trim, how to glaze, how to fire to kill, that part is really pretty shaky because we're still learning a lot about that. But the willingness is there. And if that willingness is persistent, then we've got... Um, nothing but discovery ahead of us. Okay, so what I'd like you to do is take out your phone, or if it's already out, or locate your phone. A constant problem with me. I'm always calling up Carol Ann and saying, please ring my phone. It's out in the truck and I have to. Okay, so what we want to go to is um, Ira Glass, I-R-A-G-L-A-S-S, -S, um, YouTube. Is that um Oh, work, you can right? hear and it. We get into it. And we get into it because we have good taste. But it's like there's a gap that for the first couple of years. I <laughs> this morning I couldn't hear it. It isn't so good. Okay. Do you find it? YouTube, watch, listen, stream.
check which one. You just create a process when you want to select. No, it should just be. The creative process? Hmm? The creative process? Yes, creative process. Okay. Got it? Okay. Beginners. And I really wish somebody had told this to me is that um, all of us who do creative work, like, you know, we get into it, and we get into it because we have good taste, but it's like there's a gap that for the first couple of years that you're making stuff, what you're making isn't so good, okay? It's not that great. It's, it's, it's trying to be good. It has ambition to good, but it's not quite that good. But your taste, the thing that got you into the game, you, your taste is still killer, and your taste is good enough that you can tell that what you're making is kind of a disappointment to you. You know what I mean? A lot of people never get past that phase. A lot of people at that point, they quit. And the thing I, I would just like say to you with all my heart is that m most everybody I know who does interesting creative work, they went through a phase of years where they had really good taste, they could tell what they were making wasn't as good as they wanted it to be. They knew it felt short. It didn't have this special thing that we wanted it to have. And the thing I would say to you is everybody goes through that. And for you to go through it, if you're going through it right now, if you're just getting out of that phase, you got to know it's totally normal. And the most important possible thing you could do is do a lot of work. Do, do a, a lot of work. work. Put yourself on a deadline so that every week or every month you know you're going to finish one story. Because it's only by actually going through a volume of work that you're actually going to ca catch up and close that gap. And your the work you're making will be as good as your ambitions. In my case, like I, I took longer to figure out how to do this than anybody I've ever met. It takes a while. It's going to take you a while. It's normal to take a while, and you just have to fight your way through that. Okay? There's so much wisdom in that little thing. You just have to fight your way through it. And um, with him, he has this uh, phenomenal program, This American Life on NPR, and uh, he's a genius. And to be able to summarize all of that information and what it takes in just a minute or so, that's brilliant in itself. Um, so that's worth, um, <clears throat> that's worth listening to. Let's take a, a break for a couple minutes. Oh, it's getting better. Go yeah. Back in front of the no, it's okay. Yeah, it's all right. Let's walk around, stretch our legs. You want to know anything about any of the pots in the show? I'll tell you more than you want to know. Oh, okay, good. Uh, sometimes I like to paddle these pots so they have angles to them or they their shape has changed so when they go into the kill i've got a variety of ways of uh, loading them so that they uh, respond to the flame in different ways and um, i like to use two paddles for these it's just a little bit wet but i think it'll work okay again it's that matter of how sticky they feel. So if I want to, I can push this out so that it's an uh, ovoid form.
Oh, didn't mean for that to happen. I'll get my rib. It is too wet. See if it's got any forgiveness. Originally, I was going to try to make it square. Fire hates angles. It doesn't know what to do when it gets to angles. Fire is a curvaceous presence. And when it comes to a form with angles, it, it just tries to accommodate to it. But if I aim this into the fire like this, fire's coming this way, it's going to divide when it hits this angle, and it's going to shoot off like this. And a weak part of the fire is going to come around here. But the back of the pot, the, the chimney side of the pot, is going to look a whole lot different because it didn't have the impact of the flame hitting it. And so there's likely to be more ash uh, up here where the flame hits it. But there are just so many varieties of what can happen to it. The speed of the flame, where you put it in the, in the kill, this would go back probably three feet from the front. And there might be another pot standing here. Like if this Well, suppose this was another pot that was running interference for it, OK? So there would be a shadow here, because the flame would already hit up here in a directional way. It would go scooting off. But then there would be more direct flame coming back and hitting here. So it might deposit some ash up here. And if it was hot enough, then it would begin to run down, and the pattern would fade as the um, glaze thinned out as it uh, ran down there. So there's just so many different things you do when you're loading a kill. And a lot of it is intuitive uh, with me. I'm not anywhere near as precise as uh, Jeff Shapiro is. Jeff Shapiro loads his kill inside his house and takes a photograph of the way he wants things. He has a, a setting, which is exactly uh, corresponds to the kill. 
and then when he takes everything down, takes it out to the kill, he knows how he wants to set things up. That's very precise, and I'm, I'm amazed at uh, his work. It's marvelous. But um, loading is very exciting. The small kill, I get inside and load it, but the big kill is large enough so that we can uh, load the back and the front at the same time and then move to the middle. That's where the door is. That's what we do last. And um, that is where we put a lot of the big work. Let's see. Oh, did you bring me a... Uh, You don't have a spring, do you? Oh, those are big, aren't they? Too big? Um, I have a little wire. Don't like the mesh. Yeah. Okay. Let's see how this works. It's not a kill element, is it? It is. Is it? Yeah, if I had a little smaller spring, I could do more. But I think this is going to be the start of something. It would just have four feet. I want to make more of these. So there's still a lot of clay in there to trim away, but it would still work out. Everything I've always made has been pretty light, pretty thin. And I just got this notion a few weeks ago to make some things that are heavier. And that's what I'm going to be doing when I get back. Start making things for, well, friend has a salt kill. We're going to fire later in April. And then I'll be making things for the Anagama in June, third week of June. We were going to do it last summer with Ken Matsuzaki. He was going to come from Japan and fire with us, but now he'll be coming not this summer, but the one afterwards in uh, 2022. I've had different people come and, and lead the firings. And I was 
very nervous about that. I was curious to see whether I could really stand back and let somebody else take charge of the firing. And I passed the test. I was able to do that. Uh, yeah, after years and years of leading all the firings, just to see how somebody else does it. We always learn something. So the whole crew benefits from something like that. Ken is the one that says typically in his firings, which hold maybe 800 pieces, uh, one third gets trashed, one third gets refired, and one third is good enough to exhibit. And there are some very nice videos of Ken at work. M A T S U Z A K I, Ken Matsuzaki, and the uh, Goldmark Gallery in England. Uh, made the videos. He puts huge amounts of charcoal into his kill. Um, I think he said a thousand pounds. A thousand pounds of charcoal is like a thousand pounds of feathers. It doesn't have any weight. And the kill is incredibly hot. They're all wearing masks, and, and they're just pouring these bags of charcoal into the kill. I don't know where he learned about that. I, I wish my Japanese, uh, I wish we could talk about that. So when he comes, I'm going to have a translator so we can discuss things. So this is kind of a Fred Flintstone dog bowl. Well, It's a start. I haven't read a poem today yet. This poem's called Kumquats. <clears throat> it starts with a little quote from Wallace Stevens says, the tongue is an eye. We were sharing our last shift at the kill when the shoebox from Cupertino arrived, packed with them among ferns. Oblate and aromatic, they were orange as oranges and stippled like worn out footballs. Our thumbs cruised their rinds before squeezing and bruising the insides until they felt like warm leather grapes. Only then were they fit to take in, lolling from cheek to cheek, squeaking against teeth. How long can you go without biting, she asked, and the contest was on. By the second hour, mouth chemistry had nearly dissolved the epidermal hide barely exposing the loofah-like sublayer, whole yet juice-proof. Pressed against the mouth's roof, pneumatic and leaking ascorbic savor of citrus 
It was vulnerable among canines. Mine was the longer drive home. Hourly, we called each other, confirming the tie game. Later, showering, she gave in. The eruptive gush so intense, she closed her eyes against a taste that bright. Entering the driveway, I called, waking her with the news. The seven-hour kumquat survived the 182-mile trip. Now, my voice told her ear, the juice balloon's resistance yielded between my teeth as she imagined the membrane giving way, releasing behind my smile the luminous zest no sun had ever touched. Kumquats. thought I would make, I have another, I have one more thing to trim here, and I, I want to make another one of those little bowls. Oh, okay. Another group is coming in at one. Oh, okay. So, um, is it okay if I set up over here back, John? I set the while you're trimming. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna set that up, and then uh, and then you guys will get to hear the last night. I always like this to be the the new guys that we give the lecture, even though it's first chapter Yeah, half an hour. Well, <clears throat> how many people are coming in? Oh, okay. So these people are going to be cheated out of the T bowl talk? Maybe some of them have already seen it. Oh, oh, okay. I feel better about today than I did yesterday. Um, um, yeah, I wish I was going to be working tomorrow. Well, I can work at home tomorrow. <laughs> that should be okay. tomorrow. <laughs> I'll just make uh, one more of these little square bowls. And if you have any questions, why uh, don't take them home. I'm happy to answer them or respond to them. Oh, I like pitchers a lot. I like jugs very much. I had a real nice jug that I had hoped 
would come out of the last firing uh, good enough to bring down, but it's not as good as it could have been. I, I'm going to refire it in a salt kill. Yeah, I like jugs a great deal, especially modeled after the jugs that were made in this country around 1820. They're, uh, they're ovoid. They come out, they go back in. They're really generous, classic forms. And I hate to see them die out. It's one of those forms that we, we just don't need anymore. I mean, look at the way jugs evolved in this country. They, they started out with these beautiful, graceful forms. They look like they're like holding their breath and they evolved into a square plastic jug. Now, if you took one of those square plastic jugs back to the 1820s, it would be like that movie with a Coke bottle coming out of the airplane. Oh, okay. The Gods Must Be Crazy. Hmm? The Gods Must Be Crazy. Yeah, The Gods Must Be Crazy. If you could have shown those old potters a single plastic jug, it would hold a gallon. You could pick it up with one finger. You could see through it. You could see whether a mouse drowned itself in the contents. I mean, that's the kind of thing they had to deal with in, in, the, uh, in the early 1900s. If you had a jug full of molasses and the cork came out and the mouse fell in, you couldn't tell until you tasted the molasses. This molasses is really very peculiar. So, uh, yeah, it was, um, there should be a novel written about those those potters. Because they were forced out of business by mechanical pottery making and by the glassware industry. Oh, this is getting interesting. No, sorry folks. The perfect note on which to end this misbegotten demonstration. Might be nice. Well, I tried. I would like to see this with a lot of gravel in it, a lot of the chicken grit, and uh, some silica stones that I have. Uh, this kind of form, I think, would be really good. So I want to try some. I want to try some that are really big, that I could fire on their sides in the kill. Uh, the, Gutsy. I've never really made gutsy, but I can try. <laughs> Good. Well, listen, thanks so much for coming. And um, <laughs> keep working. Uh, the way Ira Glass says, just do a lot of work. Keep at it. Yeah.